Hello and welcome everybody. This is Mary Shores and Cheryl Muir. Say hello, Cheryl. Hi everyone. <laughs> and we are coming to you live today to talk about the three P's of publishing. We're right, also we're going to do a live. super quick hello and we are gonna do a super quick QA. And in addition to that, we've got some big news to share. So yes. Cheryl, you did a photo shoot yesterday. Tell us how glamorous <laughs> that was. You know what, it's so funny, working for yourself, as as you know, Mary, is not all fun games and glamour all the time, but yesterday was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm doing a bit of a rebrand at the moment, and I went up into the Lake District, if any of you know the lakes, you'll know it's a really beautiful part of England in the northwest, up near Scotland, almost, um, and it was beautiful. We did a few shoots in um, different hotels, crashed a few hotel lobbies and restaurants and bars, and took some photographs there, and really tried to capture some really quaint English countryside too. So I get to see those shots um, in a couple of weeks and I hope um, they turned out really well. You know, having images taken is so important to your personal brand. So if anyone's thinking they need new photographs taken, let me assure you, I get nervous every time I do a photo shoot. So be encouraged that photo shoots can be very nerve wracking, but they're actually a lot of fun while you're there. So go get some new headshots done. Yes, that's excellent. And then I know Cheryl, you're going to share this in the Heart Hub group. So oh, yeah, while you are, while you're sharing, let me just take a moment to say hello mm -hmm. to anybody who's watching. And please, please let us know in the comments where you are watching from, and maybe hit one of the like buttons or the heart buttons to let us know you can hear us okay. And then Cheryl is getting it shared in the Heart Hub group. So. Today, we're going to talk about the three P's of publishing, which are proposal, platform, and promotion. And so, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, Cheryl, is that so many people, they, they tell me ever since they found out, like if somebody meets me and they find out that I'm a Hay House author, the first thing they ask me is, how did you get a book deal with Hay House? It's like they yeah. really oh, want to yeah. know. And obviously they wouldn't ask me that question if they didn't have something that they themselves were really ultra passionate about. And so that's the question I get is how did you get a book deal with Hay House? And so the answer to that is I had to write a proposal and turn it in to Hay House Publishing. Now, I think that there are so many benefits in my life to becoming a published author. So like weekly, in fact, it's actually, I can't even say weekly anymore. I need to say daily, that daily I get invites to speak at a conference or to speak as part of an online summit. Um, I get multiple offers for podcasts every single day. And you know, the, the opportunities that it has brought has really been one of the biggest benefits. Um, also, there's this feeling of accomplishment because for so many years, I had really, really, really wanted to write a book. And I'm talking like 10 years. And I just struggled. I felt so stuck. I mean, I felt like, I felt kind of like imposter syndrome. Like, who am I to, you know, write this book? I felt like, what if my book is just the same as every other book? And um, I definitely had some limiting beliefs and stuff to get over. I just want to say hello to Emlyn. And um, I love the little butterfly. Thank you very much. Hi, Emlyn. I also want to say that becoming a published author is really something that establishes you as an expert. So if you're a life coach or if you uh, are a yoga teacher or you like to lead workshops or you want to you know, do more public speaking, um, having a book published, whether it's self-published or traditionally published, really serves to establish your credibility and establish you as an expert. So, and I'll tell a little story here and Cheryl, I don't think I've ever even told you this story. Whenever I first like got really serious about writing my book, it was because um, of several years ago, I had applied to speak at a national level conference. And so 
I had spoken at a lot of like local conferences, um, local conferences, and I tried to speak at a national level conference. And I sent my proposal in fully expecting to like have them schedule. And instead they said no. And I was crushed because I had really worked hard on that proposal and I couldn't believe that I was being rejected. It really stung. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if any of you have ever like worked hard on something and then not have it go through, but it really stung. And then I looked at the rosters of the speakers that they did choose. And what I noticed is every single one of those speakers had a book. And it mm -hmm. was that moment that I decided, okay, if I want to get on that national level stage, I am just going to have to have a book. There's just like no doubt about it. So definitely um, when you have that book that you've authored, it's going to help you establish yourself as an expert, hands down, no question. You know, it creates massive new connections in your life. I mean, the things that I have been working on to collaborate are just like, life-changing stuff. Just this morning, I was talking to a lady in Paris who is working on a project yesterday that she wants me to be a part of. Yesterday, I was talking to a lady who wants me to come and speak at her conference in Toronto called Impact Live. And I'm so excited to, I get to go to Toronto. Like, tell me, I'm telling you, life as an author does not suck. So, um, just the connections it's brought to me. And like last week, last week I was talking to someone in Israel. I met Cheryl all because I'm an author. There's also this sense of accomplishment that's hard to put into words. But the first time that someone sent me a picture of their book because it had arrived in the mail, uh, the first time I saw my book sitting on the bookshelf at Barnes & Noble, which is a bookstore chain here in the U.S., um, the first time someone posted a review, uh, the first time I was on a podcast, like all of these moments are things that I don't know that I ever thought I would ever experience in my entire life. It literally feels like a dream come true. And when I was on that stage at Hay House and was mobbed, like a rock star um, because I got off the stage. It was like crazy. So it has definitely changed my life. And another thing is it has actually been what has built my platform. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just want to tell you though, that it's not where I started. You know, where I started was having nothing to do. Uh, I had no idea where to go. I didn't know what my steps were. I actually thought that writers sat down at like the typewriter and just started on page one of their book and then just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote until they said the end. This is what happened in my head. But you know what? Maybe there's somebody who's listening or watching to us that thinks the same thing. And believe mm -hmm. it or not, if you want to write a book, whether you want to traditional publish that or whether you want to self-publish it, believe it or not, there is a process. And in order to become successful, um, you follow this process, right? And, and it's not a secret process because we're here to tell you what it is today. Cheryl, is there anything you want to add? to that? Yeah, you know, the, the biggest thing I was hearing actually was some of the, the mythology that surrounds authors. And this is something actually that Mary, yourself and I haven't talked about before. So I think this is a really, really interesting topic. When it comes to the archetype of an author, we think of somebody in like, you know, a big old jacket with a, an old pipe hanging out their mouth and was sat on the porch with a typewriter. And that just isn't the case. Even when you're a quote unquote full-time author, you still have to do a lot of other stuff that isn't just the writing of the book. The writing of the book is actually such a small part. The majority is the platform building side, um, which Mary, I know we, we talked about at length in the Aspiring Authors Workshop. Um, there's so much more to writing a book than just the writing of the book. You need to get the word out there. You need to build your, your platform as an author. And the, the book itself can help you to build your platform by getting on podcasts, by doing things like this today, by doing live interviews. Um, so a book really is an opportunity to grow your platform. It's not meant to just sit there and collect dust on the shelf. 
Yes, and Donna is asking, are you going to tell us how you did it? Absolutely, that is why we are here today to talk about how to do this. So the first thing that you have to do is to write a proposal. And writing a proposal is a document that the, the, it's a document that has several sections. So there is about the author section, there is an overview section, there is a market analysis section, a competitive title section, also a promotion and chapter abstracts, which is actually the fun. You know, when I first heard the words chapter abstracts, I was like, why do they call it something so strange? Chapter, chapter abstracts are really just the chapter summaries of each chapter of your book, and then you turn in a sample chapter. So those are the things that are included in a book proposal. Now, the really cool thing is that Cheryl and I tell you step by step how to write a book proposal in our Aspiring Authors online workshop. So we are happy to answer questions about proposals today. That's why we're here. We're also happy to talk about platform. We're happy to talk about book promotion. And we're happy to talk about the Aspiring Authors online workshop. Now, there are several benefits to writing a book proposal. So when you write a book proposal, that is the best way. That's actually the only way to get a book deal. So I got a $10,000 advance from Hay House Publishing because I was able to turn in a book proposal to them. Now, this was amazing. This was like a life-changing moment for me, as well as, so you work with publishers or is this self-published? Thanks for the questions, Donna. I love I love the questions. My book is published through Hay House Publishing. We are talking to all authors today, whether they want to traditionally publish or whether they want to self-publish. I actually think it's really, really important that even if you plan on self-publishing your book, or my suggestion is that you have self-publishing in your back pocket as a plan B in case you don't get a book deal, okay? So even though my book got published by Hay House and actually did become a number one bestseller, um, the, the truth is I was perfectly prepared to self-publish it if I needed to. So writing a proposal helps you get a book contract. It also helps you familiarize yourself with the writing process. So one of the students from the Aspiring Authors online workshop, actually, I had a chat with her about a week ago, and she told me she was so thankful that I had spent the time with her talking about writing a proposal first, because she actually was able to come up with a process that became her sample chapter. And so I don't want to give too, too much away, but it was like her sample chapter ended up being the seven obstacles to, and I'll just leave the word blank, but um, Actually, I'll fill in my own. So like if I were to write this, I might say the seven obstacles to forgiveness, but hers wasn't forgiveness. It was it was something else. So when you're writing the proposal, what it does is because you've already done the research, it helps connect you to the audience. It helps connect you to the ideas that you're going to need later on when you're actually writing the book. And it serves as a massive, massive outline. One of the biggest mistakes that... Um, Reed Tracy, the Hay House CEO, has said that people make in writing in the writing process is number one, they don't know they're supposed to write a proposal first, and number two, they don't have an outline. It's almost like outline is required process. So Cheryl, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, that's um, it's some really, really great points there. And I think the, the biggest thing there is is deciding on your method of publishing. So Mary obviously went the route of, of traditional publishing and had self-publishing in her back pocket. So if you know you're going to self-publish, that's not really something Mary and I have talked about at length, but if you know you're self-publishing and you're writing nonfiction, you can write the whole manuscript and you can really do what you want. But what we're talking about here is going the, the route of traditional publishing and getting getting the quote unquote book deal. And that's when you have to, to write the proposal first and instead of writing the manuscript. I think a lot of aspiring authors, particularly those who want a book deal, think that they need to write the entire book first. And I think that's one of the, Mary M. True degrees, one of the biggest misconceptions is that the book has to be written first and then you find the publisher. Actually, if you want a book deal, you write the book proposal, you do not write the entire manuscript first. That, that's right. When I signed on with Hay House, I only had one chapter 
of uh, conscious communications written. And I actually think that, and so, you know, sometimes Cheryl and I work together, we don't agree on every single point, or we might have different points of view, because, I mean, not only do we come from sort of different genres, but also different countries. Yeah. <laughs> So, but that's what makes us really great partners because we can really learn a lot from each other. If you plan on self-publishing, if I were you, I would still write a book proposal because a book proposal is like your business plan, okay? Because you know what I hear? Uh, so many self-published authors are coming to me and they've self-published their book, but guess how many copies they sold? Yeah, like 50. Like, like I was going to say 47. Um, yeah. <laughs> And they're really hustling a lot to sell 47 copies because they haven't done the work of a book proposal. Whereas if they, and you're writing a book proposal now, so yeah. you know, um, you know the work that it goes, that goes into it. So, That's you know, writing a book proposal might sound overwhelming, but I'm telling you, it actually will shorten the amount of time it takes you to write the actual book. So it took me seven months to write the book proposal um, in total, but that's actually kind of wrapped up into two proposals, a long story, uh, a lot of mistakes that I made when I first got started. But um, the real meat of my proposal took me between two and three months, and then it only took another nine months to turn in my first draft. So if anybody has any questions about, Donna says sounds expensive. Donna, I love that comment, but I don't quite understand it. So maybe you could elaborate so I know what, because if you write the proposal yourself, it wouldn't cost you um, anything. So, uh, la, la, la. so I'm sorry, I get distracted by the comments and it's sometimes harder to see them on Be Live. So I definitely want to address any questions you have. And if there's a delay in me seeing them, just like, I don't know, ask it again. So, Let's see, Serafina looks like she says, after last week's webinar, she has an announcement that she has um, signed up her editor. So that's amazing progress, Serafina. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Donna says she's thinking about a booklet that combines her spiritual life along with my color career. That's interesting. I'm going to use the motivation behind the hashtag I use from color to the cosmos from color to the cosmos, which will probably be the title. Looking forward to your insights. So, you know, Donna, can I just tell you something about titles? So, and this is just, this is just like what happened to me. It's more of a story, but my original book title um, got changed for, for legal reasons, but nothing to do with me. It was just that the title was already trademarked. So just so you know, um, they consider them working titles until the book is actually more in the end stages. And, and actually, if you go the route of a publisher, they have full rights to change the title. So, all right, I'm going to watch out for proposal questions. And Cheryl, I am going to give it over to you to talk about platform. Perfect. So with regards to platform building, we have a couple of questions that have come in um, privately, which Mary and myself are going to answer. But I can actually see right now that Serafina has a question about platform building. So I'll jump in and answer this. And Mary, I'd love to get your perspective as well. So Serafina asks, can you start building a platform before writing the book? Doesn't it usually work the other way around and only if your book is a success? Serafina, that is a great question. Now, Serafina is actually um, a member of the Aspiring Author Workshop, and we go into this in so much detail in the Aspiring Author Workshop, and the link is down in the comments if you are interested. So... Mm -hmm. Do you build a platform before you write the book or afterwards? And Mary, I know you do have something to, to add in here, so I will throw to you. Uh, but I always say to my clients, and I work as a media strategist for authors, you need to be talking about your book as much as six months in advance of the book coming out. So you'll be sharing all of these milestones. You'll be talking about the writing process, obviously. Um, if you do have a book deal, you've got to be very, very sensitive to what the publishers are allowing you to share. So always check your contract and make sure you stay on the right side of your publisher. Um, but you want to be sharing these milestones and getting people interested so that when the book comes out, um, 
you're not trying to climb uphill too much. People already know there's a book. We already have this warm audience. And then you're doing this promotion, maybe four to six weeks before the book, book comes out. You're getting then into that very traditional book promotion in the lead up to the launch of the book. Now, Mary, you did it another way and your book was still a huge success. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yes. So first of all, the, what Cheryl just said is exactly right. And the time to start building your platform is like right now. Yeah. The time to probably start promoing the book is maybe six months, especially the last 90 days before the launch date. But the mm -hmm. time to start building your platform is now. And what that looks like is writing your blogs, sharing your information, you know, making sure people know who and what you are, having a business Facebook page, having an Instagram account. You know, when we say platform, we're really talking about social media for the most part and also building an email list. So um, I was able to start building my email list early on which was helpful but the other stuff I simply didn't do it and here's like the embarrassing part I didn't know how I, I didn't know how I had no one to reach out to and as a matter of fact I spent um, a lot of money I think Roxanne and I were talking about it we think that we wasted about ten thousand um, dollars doing making mistakes and I'm this was this looked like let me tell you what the mistakes looked like it looked like spending money on Facebook ads that did not work it looked like um, we hired this PR expert that was not Cheryl. Um, we, hired, <laughs> we hired someone here local to our town in Champaign, Illinois, and um, that was not successful at all. It sold zero books. And as a matter of fact, the, we paid him $3,000 and I really don't know what we got out of that. So he didn't arrange any media coverage. Um, he, yeah, I mean, I'm sure in PR terms he did something, but it wasn't anything that that like was helpful. Also, I want to say that oh, Patricia is having buffering issues. So yes, Patricia, there will absolutely be a replace. Uh, thank you for asking that. So if anyone else is having that question, um, they'll be they we will definitely be having a replay. So we'll leave the video up and be sharing it in in the group as well. So. Um, yeah, so I made a mistake, but let me tell you what did work. So what did work was creating an opt-in that I gave a free gift away, which um, we'll talk more and in, in later lives and stuff about creating free opt-ins and content and like what will work and what, what, what doesn't work because there's definitely a trick to that. It's not just as simple as like, giving anything away like it really has to be something unique to you because if you just give anything away and it's the same thing that everybody else gives away nobody's gonna give you their email address um, but what did work for me was going on podcasts because podcast is sort of a way if you think of your platform as like a stadium so a stadium holds what like 50 60 i don't even know 50 60 000 people you know depending on the size of the stadium but if you think of your platform as like you're filling your stadium and one thing that was really special with me and podcasts was it was in a really easy way to fill my stadium you know maybe 200 people at a time 300 people at a time but it was free and it it strengthened my speaking ability a lot and it created like so many connections and I'm telling you it's what made my book a, a number one bestseller on Amazon so that was exciting Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, we have a really juicy question now. This was asked um, privately in our Aspiring Authors Facebook group, which is only open to our alum, our alumni from the workshop. And it was Our Lady um, Pam who asked the question about blogs. Now, it's quite a long question, so I'm just going to read a snippet so you can all get the gist of it. Uh, Pam is asking, for those that write blogs, what do you do when people send comments that are negative and not aligned with your overall brand and message? I'm now getting comments sent to my blog posts, but I'm spending time weeding through them. I want the blog to be open to comments, but I don't want people trash trashing each other or saying anything obscene. Such a great question. So, Mary, do you mind if I dive right in and, and yeah. approach right. this in my sort of PR way? So. Pam is talking about a, a blog on her own website, but this really splits into two. It splits into, are you talking about your own platform or are you talking about somebody else's platform? So for example, if you're managing your own 
a website, your own blog on your website, you can do whatever you want. You can delete the comments if they're they're you know trashy or trolly. Um, you can do whatever you want. But if you're talking about comments under say a Huffington Post article, and I used to be a contributing writer for the Huffington Post and have written for Elephant Journal, all kinds of different places um, on online media outlets, and you're having those messages publicly, that's a slightly different game. So, Mary, what are your thoughts on that in terms of dealing with, um, have you ever had that? I've never asked you that before. Have you ever had um, any obscene or, or really negative comments about your work or on your blogs or videos? So, one time I had more something that I would consider a critique. So, I had used an un, I had used a piece of draft that was out of the book that was edited and, and I just was lazy that day. So, I just sort of posted it as a blog. Um, which is like repurposing content, right? And someone just commented, and it wasn't even mean, they just said, we'd rather see this story from the first person because it was like something about Brene Brown. Anyway, I mean, so I haven't had negative comments about like on my specific blog, but here's what I will say. I have seen other people's responses to negative comments. And what I notice is a lot of times people will just say something like, thank you for the feedback. But if it's really nasty and they're taking it to a personal level, so like in my in my day job, like in customer service training and stuff like that, what we would say is always validate. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you sort of validate and bridge so you can tell someone, thank you for the feedback. But there's a difference if somebody's giving you feedback or someone's personally attacking you. Yeah. So if it goes to personal attacks, I recommend what Cheryl is saying to just delete the comment mm -hmm. if you have that control over the comment. Um, if it's a Huffington Post situation, I suppose I would probably ignore it because uh, some, if you respond, it'll probably just get the other person to respond again. Now, here's, uh, here's my nightmare story. So I had um, a celebrity hate stalker. Oh, like this is a true story. <laughs> I know, Cheryl's like, all the things I didn't know about Mary. I, I um, haven't heard this one. No, I don't. No, I know. So, and this was not the surprise that you guys are getting today. <laughs> um, so, you know, some of you may know that I have a monthly Hay House live series that streams out to tens of thousands of people at, on Hay House. And I'm actually doing one on Monday on the Hay House page. And the first time I did it as a series, which was in December, so this would have been my second um, Hay House live, this guy got on there and he hates me. This is my celebrity hate stalker. And so he's blocked from all of our channels, okay? He's blocked off our Facebook. He's blocked from our email. This guy went so far as to like, when we would block one email, he would actually create a new email account so he could send in new comments. Um, that's how bad this was. But we couldn't block him from Hay House. It's kind of like what you're saying. So he was like, I'm doing this live and he's just commenting one thing after another, after another. Well, what he didn't know was I couldn't see the comments because the way that the, 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 the technology that was being used, I couldn't actually see the comments, yeah. but all the other people watching could see the comments. Yeah. And what happened in my situation was my fans sort of told him to like get lost. Yeah. I mean, they seriously told him he was being a mental case. And then afterwards, um, Hay House ended up blocking him, which is kind of sad because the guy actually was a huge Hay House fan. In particular, he was a huge Wayne Dyer fan. Mm -hmm. And um, it broke my heart actually a little bit that they blocked him because, um, yeah, it just... But I understand why they did it because he wasn't contributing anything. He was only being belligerent. And I mean vulgar, vulgarly belligerent. Yeah. And I think, too, it comes down to really understanding that, that we always hear, don't we, hurt people, hurt people. And that is so true on the Internet. If, if, you know, if you're really happy within yourself and you feel really centered, you don't need to go on someone's blog or someone's live video and be abusive. So obviously there's something that's happening within that person. So if we can have compassion, that's really, really helpful. Um, in terms of how to actually deal with the comments when you can't moderate them, as Mary said, what happened on her video was that um, other people started sort of duking it out with this person and saying, come on, you're out of line. I've actually seen that uh, be the case in the comments section under Huffington Post articles. And I've received very you know, personal um, abuse for some of my uh, previous articles in the Huffington Post. But it's about really understanding certain 
areas of the internet become a bit of a fight. If you've ever read the comments section under YouTube videos, people get into arguments of things that are not even related to the topic. So if it is a comment section that you're not moderating, allow people mm -hmm. to talk amongst themselves and don't lower yourself to that level, especially if you are an author, a, a leader in your field, you don't need to start duking it out in the comments with people. Yeah, let's just like be real. How many people have gotten into a viral argument on Facebook with people that they don't even know? Uh huh. Yeah. I have. And yeah. you know, part of the problem is you're really, you're really only getting a snippet. I got myself, I remember this one time and it was around Thanksgiving last year. I got myself so involved in this other lady's business that mm. I was making myself sick. That's just not acceptable. Okay, so yeah. uh, do you have more questions in our question lineup? I do, yeah. We have a question from Brandon. Brandon contacted me on LinkedIn and he was gonna watch live. So Brandon, if you're watching live or on the replay, hello, and thank you for your great question, which is, so we just connected on LinkedIn. He said, very interesting timing. I'm currently nearing completion of the first draft of my book. And I didn't know that this, this isn't why we connected. So this is just completely divine timing. He says, is it about, um, so the, the book is about my personal fight against parental alienation and the advice I give to others to help in their journey. I'd be really interested in hearing if you have ideas around creating buzz for the book well in advance of its launch. Any thoughts and ideas would be welcomed and appreciated. So as we were saying before, Brandon, um, you want to be sharing about your book as far in advance as possible. Now, I don't know what publishing method you're using. I'm assuming self-publishing, but I might be wrong. So if I am wrong, obviously go with all the recommendations we've talked about in terms of traditional publishing. But if you are self-publishing, you have free reign to do anything you want, but no matter how you are publishing the book, make sure you're sharing lessons from the book and the general ethos of the book um, a good four to six weeks before this book is coming out. So you can share things like um, quotes from the book in a graphic that you design. You can do things like Facebook Lives. You can do interviews with people. You can do blog posts. And it doesn't always have to be what I would call strict book promotion. It can just be really, really great content that then mentions the book, that then has a call to action that says, hey, there's more about this in this book I'm reading about uh, parental alienation and it comes out on this date. Click this link for um, the, the first chapter of the book or whatever it might be. And again, be really, really careful if you do have a book deal, um, be careful that you're, you're following all the guidelines of your publisher, but you really want to start giving people a taste through some, some um, freebies. I always say it's like when you go to the, the supermarket, and I hope this happens outside of England, otherwise this is a, a bad example, but when you go to the supermarket and there's someone at the deli and they said, do you want to try this cheese? And you think, oh, I wasn't really gonna try any cheese, but okay, and you try it and you go, oh, that's really good, and they get to say, oh, it's some special stay, would you like some? And you grab a wedge of this cheese that you weren't even gonna try. So it's like that, it's like you're giving people this free sample, this taster, and once they've had a little taste of your parental advice, they say, I'd like some more, and you say, oh, the book comes out in a week, here you go. Um, so you're really just giving people a sample, a taste of what you have to offer. Now, I have to say, I'm actually not a parent, Mary, you are, so is there any really juicy um, advice you can give to uh, Brandon, any podcasts that are great for parenting that you could recommend? Well, first of all, right away, um, hello, Brandon. <laughs> I I wanted to say that please connect with me on LinkedIn as well. You can mm -hmm. find me under Mary Shores and anyone listening is welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, right away, the title got my attention because it had the words parenting, alien, parenting and alienation in it. And I'm a mom of a special needs child so my son is on the spectrum and i have felt extremely alienated as a parent so the first thought i had was i really loved how the title is going to resonate with people for different reasons and i don't know what's in your book because the other possibility for that could be like if you're a single dad and i know that sometimes single dads in the legal system um, have troubles and that could also be a form of alienation or that you know like where it's a situation where the mom is not being fair with the time with the children you know or the other person the other parents um, family there could be a lot of things but the title was very intriguing 
And I appreciated that. Um, of course, Cheryl, you know my answer to everything is write a proposal and <laughs> get on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. feel like Mary's secret formula to everything is write a proposal and go on a podcast because going on podcast is like an instantaneous way to build your credibility. And, um, and I think that writing a proposal, there's also the promotion section right within the proposal that will be your book marketing plan. And you know, for anyone who's signing up for the Aspiring Authors Online Workshop, you do have instant access. The moment you sign up, what you'll actually get is our two and a half hour, it's a two hour workshop, but we've got like a bonus 30 minutes of uh, Q&A at the end, but we're gonna go section by section through the proposal and you're gonna get that delivered to you instantly via video. You're also gonna get um, lots of course bundle resources like a platform guide, a competitive analysis guide. You're going to get um, a chapter outline, a chapter planner, as well as, and here is like, almost like I hit myself in the head because I don't know why I'm giving this away to people as a bonus for a very inexpensive workshop, but you get a free copy of my proposal. And so the reason I think that this is so valuable to people is because when you can see my proposal and you can see what the finished product looks like, I just think it makes it easier to write your own. So I am gifting you with a copy of my proposal as Cheryl has thrown in something of equal value, um, which is her Get Huffed course, which is a four module course valued at $500. I can't actually put a value on my book contract or my book proposal because I don't even know how to quantify that. Um, it did change my entire life and got me a book deal. And um, yeah, I'm thankful every day that I wrote that proposal. So Get Huffed is a four module course that's going to teach you how to become a guest blogger. And I know Cheryl, actually, you just picked up a gig where you are kind of like a permanent fixture at Forbes. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, um, I'm in talks with Forbes at the moment. They've said yes to me that they want me to be part of their coaches council, which is such a wonderful opportunity. Those new photographs that I've had done, it is no accident that I am rebranding. Um, in, in partnership with the, the Forbes opportunity. Um, when I say online media and guest blogging, I don't want to downplay the importance of this. What we're really talking about is media outlets that happen to be online. It doesn't make them any less important than TV and radio. We're talking about outlets like Inc., Forbes, Entrepreneur, Success Magazine, um, The Huffington Post, Thrive Global, Mind Body Green, Elephant Journal. Some of these outlets have larger audiences than your regional TV network might have. They have it's it's true. Worldwide. You know, like as an example of that, I mean, my going on doing the Hay House Lives reaches more than than like my local news ever would. Um, Amy Chrisman has a quick question. So I know we're, we're sort of uh, talking about the Aspiring Authors Online Workshop, but she has a question that she had posted earlier. So she said, um, do you need to get an agent? And mm. that is a really amazing question, Amy. So I hope that you're still listening. Send me a heart face or a like button if you're still listening. And um, the answer is yes. So getting an agent, this is how it works. And Cheryl can probably explain it even better than I can. So agents have relationships with the publishers and publishers do not want like hundreds of thousands of manuscripts and proposals sent into them. So they use a middleman, which is what we know as an agent. Now the proposal will be what serves to get you an agent as well. So when you have your proposal written, you can you can start pitching it to agents, which is actually not difficult to do. I'm told it's super, super easy to get an agent and they will actually send it out to multiple publishers. You know, it's one of the things that I think makes making have a proposal, having a proposal in your back pocket so valuable because once you have it written, it can be sent out to a hundred publishers at once. Okay, because let's face it, you know, a lot of authors get five, six years of denials before they get published. And I think that that's one of the reasons that self-publishing is growing like gangbusters. But again, mm -hmm. I'm still gonna say, even if you self-publish, please write a proposal. Yeah. <laughs> 
One of the things I love about um, proposals, and by the way, Mary Superpower is, if you don't already know about Mary, Mary Superpower is taking something very, very complex and creating a system around it. She's absolutely brilliant at this. So if you haven't checked out the Aspiring Author Workshop, then I definitely would encourage you to do so because the way Mary takes you through that process of writing a proposal is simply brilliant. It's simple and brilliant. Um, well, what, what else was I going to say about that? Um, not all non-fiction publishers are created equal. So you were asking about an agent, Mary. What you might also want to look into is events that those publishers host. So non-fiction publishers can vary from One World to Hay House to Penguin Living, and they all cover different areas of non-fiction. It might be spirituality, it might be personal development, it might be religion, it might be a specific part of personal development, it might be very, very um, specific. So look at the publisher. Everyone always says Hay House, but as wonderful as they are, and Mary, I know they're your publisher, there might be a different publisher for your book depending on what you're writing, Amy, and it's, it's hard to answer without knowing your topic. But have a look, just Google um, different nonfiction publishers in, in your area and, and search for some keywords there and see if they have some events. Sometimes there's book fairs, like there's London Book Fair in March, which note to self, I must book my ticket and get myself down there. Um, and at London Book Fair, there's always a, an opportunity to meet an agent. So look at book fairs and, and, and author conventions and see if you can, um, if your dream publisher is there and there's an agent there or a representative from that publisher, go to that event and get with them face to face. That's another way to get an opportunity to send the book proposal to them. Yeah, and Amy, yeah, and also, Amy she's also definitely still definitely on the line because she just sent a follow-up question. And so she said, how do you find an agent? And so I'll answer that one quickly. And it's really that what I did was like, um, I Googled agents and then I looked for some that used to actually work at Hay House. That's one thing I did. And I found an agency where actually the majority of their staff member or majority of their agents used to work at Hay House Publishing. So because publishing has changed a lot, you have a lot of people that used to work for publishing companies that are now freelancing it. Um, the traditional way is you look in a book to find out, you look in the acknowledgement section of a book and typically the author in the acknowledgement section will say, thank you to my agent and then they will name that person. So, but let me give you a hint, Amy, that um, when you do this process, so like one of the ones that I did, actually I just Googled Mel Robbins agent because I thought I should have the same agent as Mel Robbins. I love Mel Robbins. I love Mel Robbins too. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> And so I looked up her agent and when I did, it brought up this, it's a woman and it brought up her agency. And obviously like she had the big name clients. I don't know who they were, but we'll just say like, you know, a line celebrity, whatever clients. So she's not going to take on me as a client, right? But underneath her, she has like starter agents. She has agents that are starting their careers and those agents are hungry for new talent. Those are the ones and it'll say in their little caption because when you go on their website, they're going to have a little profile, you know, just like LinkedIn or something and it'll show you what their, what their specialty is. So some of them that will say, my specialty is developing new authors. And so they might not, they might not be the hottest agent on the market, but maybe they work underneath the agent who is like the hot agent mm -hmm. right now. Is that a, is that a good answer you think, Cheryl? Yeah, that's absolutely perfect. And, and um, let us know if you, you have any more questions and pop them down in, in the comments below. And if, even if we don't see it um, when we're on live, if you're watching the replay, pop your question down and the next time we do a live Q&A, we'll certainly do our best to address them there. Um, but if there are no questions now, I'd love to um, discuss with you, Mary. And we had one of, oh yeah, go ahead. There, there's one, but it's probably actually gonna lead into, um, Le Amy says, thank you. You're welcome, Amy. We hope oh. that um, you'll check out our Aspiring Authors Online Workshop. We are, it's our pleasure to answer questions for you. I have a feeling that this is just going to preempt what you were going to say anyway, but Serafina says, were we going to do a workshop on podcasting? Yeah. 
perfect. It's as if you knew we were going to talk about the Serafina. That was beautiful. <laughs> so we had so Serafina is one of our alumni from the Aspiring Author Workshop. And another one of our alumni um, actually backed her first radio interview recently, which was excellent. It was a, it was a great job of hers to, to pitch to a local radio station. But what happened is she, she felt after the interview that the interview didn't go well. She went in so excited. And afterwards, she felt a little, I think it's fair to say, a little deflated because she was asked a question she didn't anticipate and what happened was the interview started going in a completely different direction than she'd anticipated and she she effectively what we would say in PR she lost control of the interview so there's a number of different things I can tell you I worked in PR for well I have worked in PR for eight years in total so I'm trying to condense eight years into one lovely soundbite for you there's a number of different things you can do. One is to develop key messages. So when you go in, be sure to write down the three things you want to communicate and link to that as mm -hmm. often as possible. And also brainstorm some of the questions that the interviewer is likely to ask. In order to do this, you really need to be doing some media training. I'd really encourage you to do that, whether that's with someone like myself or whether you're just watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts to get ideas for, for media training and media interview techniques is the term you would want to Google, although it's called media training within PR. And you want to be brainstorming the type of questions they're going to ask. What I always used to ask clients when I was in corporate public relations is, what's the one thing you do not want a media outlet to ask you? Because they're going to ask that. So practice your answer to that question. For example, if you're working in giving people advice on relationships and you're single, they're going to ask you about that. So have an answer prepared. Um, what I would also say as well is, is we're going to be covering this in a lot more detail in a um, podcast course that we will be releasing. Mary, would you like to tell everyone a little bit more about that? I would. So Cheryl and I have been working feverishly around the clock. Um, and I literally mean around the clock because yeah. we are working on creating the five day podcast challenge, which is turning into a full time course that we are so excited about. So one of the things that I've done exceptionally well to become a best selling author is book myself on Literally, I think as of yesterday, I'm up to 145 podcasts. Now that is since February 1st of 2017. So in one year, I've went on 145 podcasts and that averages out to more than 20 a month. So there were times that I was on sometimes two or three podcasts in the same day. And this was a game changer for me. So that's the reason why we want to bring you this podcast challenge so that we can show you step by step how you can book your own podcast. And I wanted to um, add to, and we actually have a, we have, this was um, kind of the announcement, but I have a big surprise announcement for you guys. Do you want me to just do that now, Cheryl? And Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, like Cheryl and I, we are not the salesy people who say, hang on till, like we forget to tell you that we have yeah. like so many surprises yeah, and things going it. on. So um, the, okay, here's a big surprise. So we started this podcast challenge and at first it was just going to be this little thing that we were going to do and then it's grown and grown and grown and now I've created a workbook and I've created an entire course and now I've brought you, I think most of you know if you're in the Aspiring Authors Online Workshop um, or excuse me, Aspiring Authors Online Facebook group then you already know that I did an interview with an agent which was extremely fun. So a friend of mine is a podcasting agent and she used to be a producer as well as have her own show. So she did an interview where she was just telling us what these people are looking for to get on the show. And I did another interview with another person, but I haven't, I've got that one scheduled. It's not completed yet. So I won't talk too much about that, but here's the big surprise that a lady who I was on her podcast last week, she said that what she's throwing into our challenge is that everyone who signs up for the podcast challenge will get to pitch her show. And her show is an amazing show and it has a great title. It's called Entropology. So don't overwhelm her right now. You actually have to uh, sign up for the podcast challenge, but there you go. You already get one free pitch just by being a person who took the, she was so excited. She was like, I've never heard of anyone 
doing this. So that was my big surprise announcement. Um, also, I want to say that my book, Conscious Communications, hit the bestseller list again on Wednesday. So that was super exciting. The um, We're doing a pre-launch of the podcast challenge. So some Serafina, I believe you're already signed up, so I don't think you have to worry about it. But if you were signed up before because you took advantage of our offer on content creation, then you do not need to sign up again. Um, but if you're not signed up, then click the link. We are offering a pre-launch price of $97. And after we're done with the pre-launch, the regular price will be $137. And this will be a five phase, five day challenge. So I'm super, super, super excited about that. Okay, so I can be really long-winded because I'm a public speaker and my speeches are usually like four hours. So I wanted to go back to uh, the situation from aspiring authors Facebook group. And mm. this group is very special. So it's it's a group specifically for people who enroll in our courses so that they can ask questions, they can get support, we can share each other's blogs, we can collaborate with other people who are who have the same similar goals as we do. And I really love the energy in this group. I mean, we just started talking about podcasts and then all of a sudden, without even trying, people started getting booked on podcasts and they were so excited. But what happened to this lady is she's a wedding planner and similar to what you said, um, she went on the show and all they were doing was berating her because she's not married. Yeah. And so... I said, like, let's talk about how we could have responded to this. So mm -hmm. the way that and this happened to me actually last week because I was on a show and on air, the guy said to me, I almost canceled. I almost canceled the show today because I didn't want to interview you. And this was a huge learning moment for me. Um, we actually kissed and made up and he told me all the reasons why and they all made sense. And it was amazing. And I have this really great relationship with him now, but I had to handle myself correctly because that could have went one of two ways. Like I could have been like, hey, a-hole, you know, why in the world would you say that? Or I could have gotten defensive or I could have, you know, I could have done a lot of things. But mm. if I were in the position of I'm the wedding planner and I am now being questioned why I am not married, how can I be a wedding planner? I think the correct thing to do is to say, I'm so glad you asked me that question because it gives me a second to explain to you the moment that I became absolutely passionate about wedding planner. And then, so you can actually take what she said, you can say, that's a really great question. Or, you know, in my case, because I'm like a spiritual, you know, new thought leader and my book is personal and and personal development and growth, but my day job is I own a collection agency. So you can imagine, I was actually on Chicken Soup for the Soul and the only thing she wanted to talk about was the collection agency. So, yeah. you know, it puts me in the same kind of spot. Like how can you be a spiritual leader when you own a collection agency? Yeah. So you have to learn how to say, you know, everyone is fascinated with that part of my story. And let me tell you why I'm so passionate about wedding planning, about debt collections, about whatever it is you do. And so many people think that to get on a podcast, you have to be like this big name specialty person when really what they're looking for is the niche. You know, mm -hmm. they're looking for the person who's who's overcome an obstacle. They're looking for the person who's had a near-death experience. They're looking for, um, I know when I told my agent about um, one of our members, Karen Kay, because she's a fairy, uh, oh, fairyologist. Yeah, so uh, my agent got super, super excited. She was like, fairyologist, what's that? Like immediately when she heard those words, she wanted to know more. So, all right, I'm gonna open it up to any more questions. And if we, I would uh, take it over back over to Cheryl to see if you have anything else to add. Yeah, you know what? I actually just want to, um, I want to commend Mary for a second there because what she did when she explained um, our, our wedding planner workshop alum, um, when Mary explained that, she intuitively knew how to answer that because she's been on 145 podcasts and she has that experience. And really it is, it takes experience to know how to handle yourself in interviews or just generally in conversation. And Mary has that skill set and she's developed that um, 
through through experience. Now, knowing the theory from my background in PR, what Mary explained is actually a technique known as bridging, which means you acknowledge the question, question, you bridge, and then you start talking about your key message. So the bridge in there is, um, well, the acknowledgement is, I'm glad you asked that. The bridge is, and let me tell you about why I'm so passionate about wedding planning, which is your key message. So it's, if you look at, you don't want to be too much like a politician, but you, if you look at some of Barack Obama's old interviews when he was in office, remember those days, how, how beautiful were those days? I won't get too political, but how beautiful were those days? But if you look at some of his former interviews, um, he was great when he was asked about healthcare and he didn't want to talk about healthcare. He said, you know, healthcare is a really important thing. But what's really more, what's a lot more, what is also very important, bridge, is education because it creates jobs in the economy and da, da, da. And next thing you know, he's talking about the economy and he was asked about healthcare. He right. hasn't dodged the question, he's acknowledged it, but he bridged and said, you know, that's really important. Do you know what else is important? This thing that I want to talk about. So there's ways of bridging um, to your key message. If you don't do that, you let the interviewer take control of the interview and you start falling down this media rabbit hole and next thing you know, you've completely lost control of the interview. You need to also remember that a podcast interview, a media interview is not a conversation. It is not a conversation. So you need to take control of it, have your key messages and use those bridging techniques that Mary talked about. I went on a yeah. tangent there, I apologize. No, I, I, it's so perfect and I love it that you had like the technical stuff to put to um, what are just great interviewing skills. So mm -hmm. being, being on podcasts is absolutely what brought me the level of success that I've had and um, you can Google me, Mary Shores, and if you wanna check out podcasts, just Google Mary Shores plus podcasts and you'll see pages and pages and pages of them coming mm -hmm. up. Um, and like some really big podcasts too. Like I've been on podcasts that have over a million um, listeners per month. So mm -hmm. that is super, super exciting. I also, um, oh, I'm so good at doing that. Oh, so in my, in my day job, um, one of the things that I do is teach customer service workshops. And one of the things that we always say is that everything you say either creates a connection or drives a disconnection. So the way that you actually respond to an interview's question can help you to create a connection much more than completely. Because if you get thrown off during the interview, you're going to be miserable the rest of the time. I can oh. promise you that. So listen, as I sign off, I just want to say thank you for all of the questions. They are very much appreciated. We hope that you have um, watched live. We're, if you watch replay, just put hashtag replay and we'll be in here later on and through the weekend answering questions. And I would love, love, love to see you sign up for the Aspiring Authors online workshop where we will teach you step-by-step -step how to write a proposal, how to set up a platform, and how to do some book, promosal, pro, book pro, promotion. <laughs> and that workshop, which is co-hosted by Cheryl and I, is only $129. And for that, you honestly get so much, so much. the Aspiring Authors Facebook group, which is an exclusive group. In fact, you can't even Google the group because it's secret. So yeah. you can only get an invite when you sign up for our course. So thank you so much. And um, I am going to sign off now. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey, this is Mary. Thanks so much for watching. Check out a free chapter of my book, Conscious Communications at maryshores.com forward slash free chapter. The link is in the description below.